Hello, everyone. I hope you all made it into this session. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day. Uh, that's Sander Borte. Uh, Sander comes from the CWI in Amsterdam. And uh, many of you might know him for um, having worked on spiking neural networks long before, before they were fashionable. So spike prop, for instance, that's Sander right there. Uh, so it's a really great pleasure to have him here uh, for a talk today. And uh, he will talk about effective and efficient computation with adaptive spiking recurrent neural networks. Take it away, Sander. Yes. Thank you, Friedemann. So it's great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk to so many people. Like uh, you say, I've been doing this for a while, and I don't think I've ever seen 300 people actively interested in this at one place. So that's very cool. Uh, and I hope to show you all a little bit about cool spiking neural networks that we've been working on over the last year and a half, basically. And um, so starting with this challenge, effectively, this is Jan Le Kuhn, um, I think ISSCC from last year, <clears throat> where he's expressing his skepticism about spiking neural networks and neuromorphic architectures. And not in the least reason for because there are, as he put it, no spike-based neural networks come close to state-of-the-art on practical tasks. And then, of course, the next question is, why do you build chips for algorithms that don't work? So um, I take it as a challenge. And, and I'm not saying he's completely wrong or completely right, but I think we, we get a lot closer to this. And I can show you at the end how close we got. So brief outline of the talk. Uh, I think I have a, the whole talk is scheduled for 45 minutes. Uh, Freedom, correct me if I'm wrong. I think I planned it for about 35 minutes for some questions. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, spiking neural networks. I just addressed the main problem that, that other people are seeing outside spiking neural networks. And I'm going to go through some of these things. What is a spiking neuron? Uh, how can you do big things like image classification? Temporal classification, surrogate gradients, and I'm going to show you how we, how far we got on these these real problems with adaptive spiking recurrent neural networks and surrogate gradients slash PPTT. A lot of talk. So of course everybody knows this: um, spiking neurons in the brain. Most neurons are spiking neurons, uh, rather than the neurons that we usually talk about in machine learning. Spiking neurons are a lot more complicated and elaborate than artificial neurons. They are comprised of, uh, of cell bodies, uh, dendrites that receive input, axons that transmit pulses to the next neuron. Um, it doesn't just connect. There's a synapse in between uh, the axon and the next dendrite. Uh, when a spike arrives, the axon releases um, vesicles with neural transmitters that cross a synaptic cleft and then influence the somatic state of the next neuron. It's all, it's all actually quite complicated. Uh, once you go down to it, if we, if we abstract it a bit, you can say that input spikes uh, affect the membrane potential of the next neuron. Uh, positive input spikes, excitatory inputs, increase the membrane potential. Um, if, not, if it's not too much, the potential starts to decay again. I think this is what you see here. Do you see that? I can use a laser color. So if there's an input spike and it's an excitatory input spike, the current flows into the neuron and then current flows out again. If you get a couple of spikes into the neuron, then it will reach some kind of threshold and the neuron will actually generate a spike. Now, when the spike is being generated, spike goes to the next neurons, uh, but also the membrane potential of the neuron itself is being reset and the whole process goes on again. But this is what's, what real neurons do, at least almost all of the new real neurons in your brain. And it's quite different. If I, if I abstract the whole thing, we, we have a schedule like this. Uh, spikes come in, something happens to get it into a potential. Uh, there is some sort of a nonlinear function and maybe stochasticity that puts, turns it into spikes. Every there's a spike, you have this refractory response and the spike goes to the next neuron. And if we go to artificial neurons, we have a very different um, picture. And in artificial neurons, you have an analog value that is being generated by a neuron that's weighted by a weight. Uh, these sums are added up to get your activation, and that is 
activation is taken through the transfer function and you get an analog value that goes to the next neuron. Um, so if you want to come from, from these spiking neurons to this, you, you are making a bunch of assumptions about how spiking neurons transmit information and, and how that goes about. The general idea has always been that this analog value that is that's coming into your standard artificial neuron represents something about the firing rate, the number of spikes per second in your spiking neuron. That's the this classical relationship between the artificial neuron and the spiking neuron. Then all these rates add up to some sort of a value and the soma of the, the neuron adds it up in a nonlinear way. So then you get a nonlinear function to get the output firing rate of your artificial neuron. Note that in your artificial neuron, there's really no concept of time. This is all frame-based. There are values coming in, they're multiplied. There's a function being applied and there's a value coming out. There's so no sense of timing or whatsoever. <coughs> so if you think about a real spiking neuron and you're trying to think about how do you get to these firing rates, it, it's actually a little bit complicated because we do want to have a firing rate or some analog value at any time. But the question is, how does a neuron actually compute that? How can, how can, what is a neuron, a spiking neuron actually aware of in terms of a firing rate? Um, a simple one is to say, well, I'm just computing an instantaneous firing rate um, by taking the time between the current spike and the previous spike that, that is you're receiving. You can just do one over, one over the time difference and you get a firing rate. But that, that doesn't add up with the computation that's going on in your spiking neuron, as I just showed it. The other idea that's often being mentioned is, is some kind of population coding. That's where you say, well, I'm, I, my artificial neuron actually doesn't really represent a single spiking neuron, but it represents a whole population. And if, 100, if I have 100 spiking neurons, then I could say, well, at any time, I can just look at how many spikes I'm getting from those 100 neurons, if they're roughly similar. And then at any time, the input neuron or the neuron can see as input some kind of a rate, sometimes of an intensity. Now that works, but it's very wasteful. So there is another way um, that, that we've been looking into for a while, which actually fits much better, but it's still a rate code. And I'm going to show you how that works in a very simple example. <coughs> So any spiking neuron will be receiving spikes. The spikes, if nothing happens, if there is no spiking mechanism, the spikes will result in some sort of a trajectory of the membrane potential of the neuron. And here I only took in positive inputs. Now, of course, there is a threshold in your spiking neuron. So when you reach threshold, there will actually be a spike that is emitted. And there is subtracted from the input a refractory response. Now, since there is a spike being emitted by the spike neuron, there is a postsynaptic potential that is added at the next neuron. So we subtracted the refractory response, and now current comes in again. It keeps coming in to the neuron, so the potential goes up until it reaches threshold again. So another spike is emitted. Another refractory response is re subtracted from the spike neuron, from the potential, and another potential is added to the next neuron. And this will keep going. And you'll get your spikes, you'll get your sum of refractory responses, and in a filtered way, those spikes are added to the next neuron as a sum of postsynaptic potentials. And you can already see there is some relationship between the positive part of the input into the spike neuron and the sum of postsynaptic potentials that will arrive at the next neuron. Now, this is a very simple and linear way of encoding signals, at least only the positive part of a signal. It's actually not a bad way of doing it. So here I'm plotting the, in this case, the, the potential that I'm putting into the cur into the neuron and only the positive part. So this is my signal that goes into the neuron. Here I'm plotting the potential of the neuron and I, I, I'm drawn a line where the threshold of the neuron is actually. And what you will see is that current goes in and then a spike will be generated a refractory response is, is subtracted. And here we're just keeping track of how much is being added in terms of postsynaptic potentials to the next neuron. So here it goes. And as you can see here, the, in purple is the approximation of the positive part of the input current. It's actually not a bad approximation. 
we really are following the signal quite actively with not so many spikes. This is a couple hundred milliseconds, and we're using you know, maybe a dozen spikes. So such kind of a rate coding with some of postsynaptic potentials is pretty effective in general. There is a small, so you can show that if you have a mechanism like the spiky neuron that we discussed earlier, and it is doing this whole business of filtering a nonlinearity spiking and a subtraction, that it is an effective way of encoding an input into a spike train. It actually maps exactly to an analog digital digital analog conversion. And this is something that's been shown in the past a number of times. I'm just putting in some uh, recent papers from Yoon in 2016 and Nair and Indiviri also showed that in 2019. If you have a, a mechanism like this for a lift neuron, a leaky integrated fire neuron, it maps to a particular kind of asynchronous pulse sigma delta modulation coding scheme. So it's a kind of neural of rate coding. We know it can do, can do really well to approximate analog signals using a spike train. And what we can also note is it actually works quite well for low firing rates and long enough kernel lengths. So long postsynaptic time constants. Now there's one tricky part and that's that electrical engineers, this is an electrical engineering solution, they usually have good control over the bandwidth the, uh, of the input of their signals. And neurons don't necessarily have that. So this is quite obvious. If you tr do, try to do the same thing and you use a much smaller threshold, so you mismatch uh, deliberately the amount of current that comes into the threshold, then you see that there are problems. So here you have the same simulation. And you see that there is, because there is a maximum firing rate, the sum of all your postsynaptic potentials actually has a maximum, a maximum amount of signal that it can convey to the next neuron. And you also get lots and lots of spikes that you may or may not want. This is much too much for a real neuron. And of course, also obviously, if your threshold is too high compared to the signal, then you're not getting at any spikes out. It's not a very exciting simulation, but it also, it means that your threshold actually needs to very carefully match the dynamic range of your input signal. So one fun thing that, that we worked on is that, of course, uh, the brain has this problem. It, it can uh, encounter very different dynamic ranges of sig input signals. Um, and it still wants to encode these signals in an efficient way. Now, this is where people have brought up uh, spike rate adaptation as a potential mechanism. Um, here, the classical example from, from Harris in 2000 is where, you just, where they study a, a blowfly and they actually change the velocity that the blowfly is subjected to. Because it's on this apparatus, we can change the torque that the blowfly is experiencing in a dynamic fashion. So we can subject it to this kind of a torque, dynamic torque, but we can also make the signal exactly twice as large and then study how these neurons, H1 neurons, actually encode this sig the velocity signal. And what you find is unlike what you would expect is that the neuron actually uses about the same number of spikes to encode both the, uh, the slow slowly evolving signal and a faster evolving signal. And it does this through a kind of spike rate adaptation. We know the mechanism. Um, what actually what you find is that if you have a fixed stimulus going into the spike neuron, the firing rate will decay over time in a, usually with a, a power law dependence. And what actually happens if you make a model out of it, one way of modeling is to say, well, every time there is a spike, I'm adding something to my threshold, which then decays again. And this is a kind of adaptation. The hypothesis is actually that adaptation allows uh, the neuron to adjust to the signal to statistics. And with power law dynamics, you could even the, adjust to the statistics over multiple timescales. And, and uh, the anecdote here is also that the models that we make for this kind of uh, spike rate adaptation seem to be very similar to how the brain consolidates memories. Now, that's a detail. But if we add adaptation to our model, we can actually get rid of this problem with the dynamic bandwidth. And we can start with really small thresholds and encode a signal in a dynamic way by effectively changing the size, changing the threshold and changing the effective size of the spikes. So it's a long story to show how you can get from 
input to uh, current to refractory responses to postsynaptic potentials in the next neuron. The main idea is that if there's a fixed amount of current coming into a neuron, it will respond with a certain, at least after adaptation, with a certain variability in the next neuron. But on average, it gives you a, a, a fixed signal input current in one neuron results in a certain amount of out input current in the next neuron. And that's the transfer function that we typically use in artificial neurons. So this is one way of getting rid of our, our problem with the, the relationship between inputs and outputs in spiking neurons. <coughs> We're essentially subtract saying that we have an activation into the neuron as a sum of weighted postsynaptic potential uh, resulting in an output that is measured in terms of an unweighted sum of postsynaptic potentials at the target neuron. And the nice thing, of course, is that these values, x of t and y of t, are always available at any time. Um, but defining the gradient, dy dt, is a bit tricky. And a, while, a long time ago already, I, I did show that if you just assume a very linear gradient, so if you change the amount of, cur of, of current or if you change the weight here between the neurons, then in a linear way, approximately the target receives more input. So the relationship between the activation, the weight, and the output is roughly linear. And you can learn a lot of simple temporal tasks this way. Another way of using this transfer curve is that you can also use it to quickly convert a standard deep neural network into a spiking neural network just by taking into the neural network, instead of your standard ReLU function, by taking a adaptive spiking neural network function, this half sigmoid, essentially. If you do that, you can do all kinds of nice image classification tasks. Sorry. And it works quite well. Spikes go in. You have a fixed firing rate for each active pixel. And then you need to somehow decode spikes on the outputs. Um, if it's easy, then you can measure it as output neuron, you, you measure that it's exactly a zero and not one of the others. If it's a little bit more difficult, then you also see that different numbers have, get different activities over time. I'm going to skip the... Uh, um, one trick that we can use, this is all fine, and other people have done similar conversion tasks. But if you have the, the, the transfer function, then you can do a trick in the neural network, and that's that you can dynamically adjust the precision that with which you're encoding signals. So you can tune the neuron to use settings where it uses relatively few spikes to encode a fixed stimulus, which results in a relatively large variation in the received signal in the next neuron. But at, at the same time, we can change the parameters of the neuron so that it uses a lot more spikes to encode the same level of signal and if we then reduce the, the synapse between the two neurons, you would get the same average signal at the next neuron, but with a lower variability. And this could be one way to model arousal. Uh, for example, by saying that if you start out with a bad signal, like something which is encoded with relatively few neurons, then if there is some confusion between is this a nine or is this a four, you can change the context in the neuron, in the, in the neural network. You can change all these weights and arousal curves. Use more spikes to actually figure out that, yes, this is a four rather than a nine, where here you are uncertain when you don't use a lot of spikes. So this is one model of arousal as a tension, where you dynamically tune the precision in the spiking neural network. This is attractive, maybe not for images, but imagine that you have an edge AI um, problem, then you do want your, your device to run usually at low energy, but only when it's confused about what it's seeing, it should use more spikes and be more certain about what is going on. So arousal could be a dynamic mechanism to, to tune the number of spikes that is being used in the neural network. And this actually works quite well. It, it almost halves the number of spikes that we need for different uh, tasks. Uh, but at the expense of, of reaction time, of course, of latency, because first the neural network is not performing all that well, and then it detects so for some images that it's not so good, and then it needs to encode a lot of things at a higher position. <clears throat>
Now, just to come back to why spiky neural networks in general, and of course, we, what we're really after is, is something which exploits the fact that we are using only one bit per spike and we don't have a lot of spikes in our network. Then, then it makes sense to use spiky neural networks from a machine learning perspective. Um, it also helps that if we have these one bits per spike that we can just add the weight to the next neuron rather than having to do a, co a costly uh, multiplication at every time step. If you want to exploit this, you're not really the, the, the these kind of image co uh, image classification tasks are not really the most obvious uh, cases. You you really do want to go to time continuous cases, such as speech or signal analysis and robot control, maybe cognition, although I've left that out here. And and this is uh, these are the sort of tasks that we focused on to to work on with co compact spiking neural networks. And here we looked at, at two kinds of tasks, both uh, temporal tasks, uh, both streaming tasks and classification tasks. And in a streaming task, imagine there is an IoT device sitting somewhere. It's measuring all the time. And it has to have an answer for what it's seeing at every time step. So at every time step, it needs to have an answer for what is the probability of what it's seeing at this particular time, given what it knows, maybe a bit of the, in the past, and maybe you can even run uh, with a little bit of buffer. So you're already, you had information about this data point, but you're saying something about this data point. And you have to determine the class for every time step in your, your, uh, your task or in your uh, signal. So this is an example of an ECG signal. Um, the task here is to, de to detect for every time step what the particular phase of the heart rhythm is in like. And there are a couple of different phases that are all call in different colors here. So when you are measuring this with people, you want to see when there are certain parts of the, of the phase in the heart rhythm. If there are anomalies in these phases, that points to, can point to heart disease. So this is why people want to do that. But of course, you cannot record that for a long time and then start analyzing. You want to, to be able to say something reasonably fast when these phases are going the wrong way. So that's the streaming task where we try to classify at every time point, given only a certain window around that time point and not the entire sequence. So in the next time step, we get a little bit more information, but we need to classify this data point and so on. And this is in contrast to, to a lot of classification tasks on time series, where you're basically given the entire time window and then asked what is the class associated with this particular time window. So this would be a, a classification time task in, in a temporal domain. So what we did is we designed a spiking recurrent neural networks with multiple layers. So we took our, our inputs. Input can be any part of your temporal signal. And then we, we just created a layer with uh, fully connected, fully locally connected uh, spiking neurons that are then connected to another layer of spiking neurons that are then connected to an output layer. And because this is a temporal task, we then simply try to minimize the loss function that we defined on the output layer and simply means doing arrow back propagation through time. We know what the class should be at any time. Oh, here what the class should be at any time. And then you can do your classical error back propagation through time to optimize all the weights in your network to solve the task as best as possible. Now, that's very easy to say, of course, but spiking neurons are a little bit annoying because it's not that easy. Because spikes, the relationship between spikes, weights, potential, and spikes is a little bit nonlinear. Actually, it's discontinuous. So doing our standard gradient descent doesn't really work. Um, especially this case, how do you, how does your spike change if you change your potential? That one's uh, a little bit tricky and discontinuous. If you make your potential too low, there is not a spike and that's always a problem. You cannot quite measure that. Um, this is something I ran into, of course, all the way back in 2001 already with spike prop. And what I did then was to say, well, I just going to assume that this is a linear relationship. If I change my potential a little bit, I assume the spike timing will also change a little bit and in a linear fashion. Now that, that is a, a very specific case for spike timing, but you can do that in a much more general case. And Emre Nefci and Friedman Senke, they had a really, really nice 
uh, way of putting that and, and phrasing it as surrogate gradients in the general case to make an approximation that makes this relationship um, differentiable, in meaning we just put an assumption about what the gradient of the membrane potential with respect to the spike is like. And here we use it as a normal distribution around it. Now, then we can solve the whole problem. Defining, if we define a loss function on the output, we can use PyTorch to train the whole network all the way back to optimize the output. I should say a few things about what we did, some specifics. The first is that we tried a lot of different things on how to encode uh, inputs in general with spiking neurons. Because in these cases, you have an analog input signal, and it somehow has to be turned into spikes for, for some of the problems. Uh, we tried a lot of different things. We ended up reporting data for Poisson population coding or just Poisson coding. Other things, like just intensity coding, um, we, we tried a bunch of different things. They all worked about the same, uh, roughly the same performance, and we didn't find anything that worked much better or much worse. So we just went with this, because it's the general accepted way of doing it. Output's a little bit more tricky, because we need to define an output at every time step and, and have to think about what it is. Um, we went for two ways, two, two things. In the classification tasks, you can do a spike count kind of way. You just count how many spikes you have in a certain time window, and then have the highest spike count be the winning neuron. If you do a streaming task, we found that we can also use spiking neurons that don't spike, which might sound a little bit strange. But if the neurons don't spike, they just accumulate current, which then decays again. And you can just take the, the highest or the most active neuron, the most highly activated spiking neuron as the winning neuron at any time. Now, the real trick is that we use PyTorch to train this, because with surrogate gradients, we can define the gradient in PyTorch, and we can use the whole framework that's been developed so very uh, nicely at frame at Facebook to do their hard work for us. Uh, instead of computing everything bit by bit, PyTorch will adapt everything. And that means we also, it's, it's very easy to adapt the spiking neuron parameters themselves. And that turned out to be the trick that we needed to get really good performance. So what do I mean? Uh, we went for two different kinds of spiking neurons. First of all, the standard lift neuron, the standard leaky integrated fire neuron. And here you have the equation. Here's the surrogate gradient as we put it together. Um, but we also went for adaptive spiking neurons. These are these neurons that every time when they spike, they increase the membrane, the threshold, and then the threshold decays again. So we put that together. This is actually the model that we took from a paper from uh, Guillaume Bellac who did some uh, very nice work that I think we will hear later about uh, today. Um, but we can make, we use these spiking neurons in the network and we train all the parameters, including the membrane potential here, the membrane potential in the lift neuron and the membrane potential in the adaptive neuron and the time scale of adaptation. That's the decay rate of the adaptation. We train both these parameters in the adaptive neuron to improve the, to solve the task. And I can say this works actually remarkably well. And it delivered, as far as we know, uh, state of the art on a number of tasks. So here you have the sequential MNIST. This is where you feed in pixels one at a time into the re spiking recurrent neural network and so on. And you try to classify what the digit is that you're seeing. And here is the, uh, in, in standard reinforcement learning or standard deep learning, the, the best network gets 99.4%. And with some effort, we get very, very close with the um, spiking recurrent neural network. With not so many neurons, to be honest, because this uh, dense INDRNN is a very expensive one. It's very deep, very many neurons. Um, and the SRNN also outperforms the LSTM here in, and in other most other cases as well. What is not being outperformed is actually the ReLU SRNN. So it turns out that the, the, the shape of these spiking neural networks with tunable parameters inside the neuron is actually a really good idea. Because what we did is we, instead of having spikes come into the neuron, we have membrane potentials coming into the neuron at every time step from the other neurons. So basically, instead of spikes, there were 32-bit analog values coming in. And also, 
what was transmitted to the next neuron was also the potential of the neuron. This is how we turned a spiking neural network into a non-spiking spiking neural network. So, but we are adapting the exact same network with exactly the same parameters. And it turned out that that does a little bit better than just the standard recurrent neural network with spikes. But if you look at the other numbers, then you also see that the, the spiking neural network um, does a lot better. I think with some modifications here, we got to 94. Um, for the spiking Heidelberg data set that Friedemann and, and uh, co-workers developed, this has spikes as input. <coughs> the adaptive spiking recurrent network also achieved very high performance, better than LSTMs, getting close to a very large CNN. So the CNN, if you did the math, has actually a million neurons, whereas our adaptive neuron only had an adaptive network only had 256 neurons. So we get close performance, again, a little bit worse than the, uh, the relay version of our network. But this is really no comparison with the CNN. Um, same story with the ECG data, adaptive spiking recurrent networks got the best performance that we, we, we achieved. Again, the analog one was only slightly better, but we really outperformed LSTMs and vanilla RNNs, Guru LSTM by a substantial margin. So this is in general a good idea. There are some other data sets. Recently, we worked on scaling up this, this problem. And this is some unpublished data. Um, so in the same paper, um, there is a, sp a version of the spoken command set from Google. Um, in the paper, Kramer et al. report getting seven, some 50, 73% with an LSTM, um, about 70%, 77% with a CNN. And again, the adaptive SRNN does a lot better, gets close to CNN performance. For the SOLI data set, which is a set of radar gestures, so we have 40 frames of a gesture that somebody's making in front of a, a radar, um, uh, yeah, a simple radar for uh, that is in front of a phone, like the, the Google, uh, yeah, the, the, the Google phone uses the SOLI data, SOLI radar to recognize gestures and faces. The a CNN with LSTM gets about 87% right of the gestures, and the adaptive SRNN, the latest results were getting close to 92%, so really outperforming these classical machine learning algorithms. And finally, we also got TIMID to work. So we have results on TIMID that were at least exceeding uh, the results from uh, Guillaume Balak with uh, EPROP, uh, also with fewer neurons compared to Guillaume. And I think that state of the art in machine learning, in, in deep learning is about 70% with very large uh, CNNs. So here we are a little bit behind CNNs, but we are getting very decent performance out of the, the network, something that is really getting you to become useful. Now the question is, why does it work? What makes this work? Uh, here we did a comparison. The comparison is between a ReLU SRNN and an adaptive SRNN. And you see that having an adaptive neuron gets your performance actually quite close to the analog neuron. Whereas if we have lift neurons, standard leaky integrated fire neurons, then performance really is a lot less. So having the complex adaptive neurons makes the, the task a lot more feasible and a lot more competitive. And what we also find is that if we don't optimize these parameters, the, the, the time constants inside the neuron, then performance also drops, up, drops off substantially. So you need to adapt the time constants in the spiking neurons to get good performance out. So the spiking neuron makes a significant difference. Uh, here also to illustrate, we initialize all the time constants initially uh, at a fixed value. And here are the values after training for a set of neurons, the, in this case for the SHD task. So the, the PyTorch really does adjust all these time constants to something that apparently makes the task a lot better. <coughs> There's one more result that also for different kinds of neurons, we find that if we have larger networks, our performance goes up, but also our the sparsity, the number of spikes in the network goes down, which is kind of nice behavior because the next thing, of course, we're interested in is what's the energy cost of these tasks. Uh, we did the math, and we, we we just did the math for how much energy this is costing, assuming um, some numbers for the accumulate 
uh, energy cost in a network and the multiply accumulate in a network. Usually, standard neural networks use uh, multiply accumulates because you are accumulating the activation and then you need to do this multiply with the weights. Um, in our spiking neurons, we don't need to do the multiplication with weights, so we have a much cheaper function. But we have some extra functions inside because our spiking neurons need to do some, some multiplications to get the state right. But you can do this for all these different networks. You can compute how much um, of these types of uh, calculations you're doing. And then it turns out that the energy cost for the SNN is actually really much better, about a factor of 100 better than the, than the best RNN, which actually is the analog version of our sRNN. And compared to LSTM, there's really no contest because an LSTM is ridiculously expensive in terms of computations. Yeah, I'm almost done. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the only thing we did here is that we, we are assuming that there is no cost for memory. Usually, in a standard machine, memory access costs dominate. But we will assume that people in the future will use their very clever uh, memristors to uh, avoid this problem. And then all the memory is local. And we assume that multiplies and accumulates will start dominating the energy cost. So just to summarize. Um, we did supervised learning with backpropagation through time and circuit gradients, and we achieved really high performance uh, and theoretically low power SRNNs for a lot of real tasks. Um, we also find that the type of spiking neuron model matters. And adapting spiking neuron parameters like PyTorch allowed us to make substantial difference. And uh, finally, the network architecture does matter. So I would end with this. I think uh, we should get uh, this to Jan Le Kun, and he should be a little bit less skeptical. I think this will save a lot of energy in the future, and there really are now good algorithms. The circuit gradients do a magic, a magic trick. Um, there, are, of course, there are still a bunch of open questions to work on in the future. So where should we go with spike endurance? Should they be more uh, real, realistic? Uh, should we have more complicated architectures? Uh, can we do anomaly contection? And, and what do you need to do with on-chip learning? These are some of the open questions that we are working on and also interested in. Um, I also hope to learn more about these things here in the, in the workshop uh, the rest of today and tomorrow. And that was all I wanted to tell. And, and I can only thank uh, my co-workers, Bojan, who did a lot of the work on the backpropagation through time that you saw, together with Federico Corradi, who's at IMAC. And uh, Davide Zambrano, who did a lot of the, um, the conversion work with the adaptive spiking neural networks. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sander, for this uh, in very inspiring talk. Thank you. And you've got a lot of tough questions, actually, which is great. Thank you very much to the audience. Um, and I think uh, the first one that actually came up is um, about the attention mechanism, I think. Um, I think you went over that quite quickly, and I also had the same question, but somebody had typed it up earlier. So that was um, Gabriel Bena, who asked, hello, could you describe a bit more the process of arousal as attention? Is it a modulation of the number of spikes used in a task, depending on the ambiguity of the outcome? So I guess the question is, how do you decide how many spikes you need? I think it's this graph, right? So. Yes. so this is the process that we used. Um, so we start with a network that is at a setting that is using relatively few spikes, in this case, on average, 12 hertz. And then after, uh, I think, 250 milliseconds, you try to make a decision. And if, the, if, there, if you cannot make a decision because a number of classes are both active and we, we use the threshold, what we did then is we changed all the parameters, like we reduced all the weights, and we increased the spike rate in the network, and then let it run for another 250 milliseconds. And that usually disambiguated the two classes that were un unclear here before the, at, at a low firing rate. Right. That's the so mechanism. Just, that I, hope, I hope that answers the question also for Gabriel. Um, so. The next question that goes got most of the votes also 
And by the way, again, to the audience, please feel free to vote up questions that you uh, find most relevant. So the next question is, your SSN model includes, oh, hang on, wait, I should first check if the person wants to come on stage. No, Dylan says, I can ask, that's fine. Thanks, Dylan. So your SSN model included a stochastic firing uh, mechanism. Is this required or important for any aspect of the training or computation? It's not in the in the, the work I presented. Uh, here we we are we added in in the graph the stochasticity is just added because everybody puts it in there. All the work that I showed you is deterministic. Um, I would. This also means that if you look from an, from a computational neuroscience perspective, you're not getting your nice interspike interval curves because the neurons are not the neurons inside the network are not spiking in a stochastic way. I think you could use the stochasticity to compute things like uncertainty. That's just my assumption. Um, so the spike in neural network models that I showed you only use stochasticity in the inputs, where they use Poisson neurons to encode analog values into spike trains. How about improving generalization, like dropout or something like that? Does it improve? Uh, the dropout, of course, is applied to um, applied to the learning stage, and we did not try it. That's an idea in the the, the stochastic uh, gradient. You're you're right. You could probably in the stochastic gra the surrogate gradient work. You could use stochasticity as a way to increase regularization. I think that would work. We didn't try that. Yeah, me neither. Somebody should try it. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> Bojan, I think he's on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you heard it. Okay, great. Let's see another question. What do we have here? So, um, okay, Rishika Mohanta says I should ask for her because she's on her phone. So. If at this point traditional ANNs perform better in most tasks, why should we even bother why, uh, with spiking ANNs? It seems like all we're trying to do is make spiking ANNs um, as good as traditional ANNs. Is there a class of tasks where spiking ANNs have a computational advantage? This question will also come back to you later during the discussion session, but uh, we would like to hear your answer already now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's a question, of course, that, that keeps coming back. Um, there, if you take a firing rate approach, the way I showed with an analog digital, digital analog conversion, and I think the circuit gradients do the same thing, then the argument really only is that I can make a much, much cheaper chip with, with, with maybe 100 to 1,000 times less energy consumption. Assuming a lot of things about memory and I.O., et cetera. But if you want to build a really big AI chip in the end, it's very nice if you don't need to spend a thousand times more energy. Actually, it's, it's prohibitive to use that much energy. So there's an energy argument. Um, if you're going to run anything on a battery, you want to be very efficient. And that, that's a huge problem. And I think here the SNNs are now demonstrating that they are almost as good or as good as our standard ANNs, but much, much more efficient in theory. And then, of course, the other thing is what we would love to have is cases where the spike in neural networks really do something different. And maybe somebody else has a good idea on that. Yeah, I we would certainly hope so. <laughs> and yeah, again, this, I think, is something we really need to get back to at the during the discussion session because it's it's obviously the question that always comes as you said thank you yeah. okay i think we can do one more uh, question um i guess that's the one that i asked but i think you answered it so i'll take the second one um so that's uh Again, I can ask, Matteo asked this question, are those uh, spiking neural networks for image, image classification recurrent, either within the layer or interlayers? If so, what's the connectivity archi archi architecture? How does this influence the performance of the model and is it important? important to me? Complicated question. Um, for the image classification task like this, 
those are for feed forward networks. They're, they're fairly deep. Uh, I think they were VGG 16 networks that we converted from an artificial network into a spiking network. So there's no recurrency, although you could say that the membrane potential and the adaptation are recurrent, but they're not used explicitly. So this is a, a VGG network. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think others did something very similar. Uh, Timote and uh, and uh, Bodo Rukauer. Yeah, that's right. In the end, also the image classification networks are usually feed forward, right? In non spiking. All right, awesome. So I think I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry about the remaining questions. We'll, we'll answer all these questions hopefully during the discussion session. But um, in the interest of time, I'd like to move on. Uh, to the next session, but let's thank uh, Sandra uh, again. Uh, I see many people sent you clap, uh, clap emojis in the chat. Thank so you. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for the talk, and I'm looking forward to our discussions later. Thank you again for having me. It's great to see so many people. All right, so then uh, we should move on to the next session, uh, which means we're going to close this one because then it closes the recording. And um, then uh, we will move on to the next speaker and you'll all get pulled into the next um, room, basically, in a second. You might see a blank screen for a bit, but uh, then things will move on. Thank you very much again for listening. And thank you again, Sander, for this wonderful talk. Thank you.